Good evening, everyone. My name is Norman Goda. I am the director of the Center for Jewish Studies here at the University of Florida, and I am delighted to welcome you to tonight's virtual event. In 1975, Lucy F. S. Davidovich published The War Against the Jews, one of the very first comprehensive histories of the Holocaust. It went through almost 30 printings in 10 years, and in its day, it was one of the most read books on the Jewish catastrophe. Yet Davidovich, though a New York Jewish intellectual, was not part of the Jewish political left. She fiercely believed in East European Jewish tradition and history. She believed in the uniqueness of the Holocaust and the socialism of her youth gave way to anti-communism and to a neoconservatism in the 1970s that was dismissive of everything from contemporary feminism to liberalism as a defining Jewish characteristic. She was, in the words of our guest tonight, a tough bird, smart, funny, brave, also stubborn, bitter, judgmental, and unforgiving. Perhaps for these reasons, it is only this year that the first biography of Lucy Davidovich has appeared. I am most pleased to introduce tonight's guest. Nancy Sinkoff received her PhD from Columbia University and is a professor of Jewish studies and history at Rutgers University. She is also the academic director of the Allen and Joan Bildner Center for the Study of Jewish Life. Her books include Out of the Shtetl, Making Jews Modern in the Polish Borderlands, which has now appeared in a second edition, Sarah Levy's World, Gender, Judaism, and the Bach Tradition in Enlightenment Berlin, and this year, from left to right, Lucy S. Davidovich, The New York Jewish Intellectuals, and the Politics of Jewish History. Nancy, good evening, and thank you so much for joining us. Uh, joining me in the questioning will be my colleague here at the Center for Jewish Studies at the University of Florida, Rachel Gordon. Dr. Gordon received her PhD from Harvard University, and she is the Samuel Shorstein Professor in American Jewish Culture at the University of Florida. She teaches courses on Jewish culture in the US during the 20th century. She is currently finishing a book project about World War II American Jewish culture called How Judaism Became an American Religion. She is also completing another book about the anti-anti-Semitic novel turned classic feature film, Gentleman's Agreement. And I should say that tonight's event is made possible by the Norma, Norman and Irma Brayman Chair in Holocaust Studies. So, Nancy, uh, once again, thank you, thank you so much uh, for, for joining us this evening. I think uh, everybody here is looking forward to a very interesting discussion. Uh, but can we start with this? Uh, a premise of your book uh, is that the life of Lucy S. Davidovich has been ignored uh, by historians in a way that the lives of other New York Jewish intellectuals have not. So for the benefit of those uh, in the audience who are not necessarily familiar with Davidovich, can you give a quick synopsis of, of who she was uh, for those who might not be familiar with her? Sure. So before that, I get to say thank you, right? So I'm going to do that. I want to thank you so much, Professor Goda, for the invitation. And I want to thank um, Professor Gordon. I mean, I just mentioned to someone that I was going to do a webinar and I was going to have a, a Europeanist who specializes on the Holocaust and an Americanist who specializes on American Judaism be my interlocutors. And their response was, well, that's perfect. And so um, it is perfect. And um, the pleasures of intellectual discourse with colleagues whom I like so much and whose work is so important is, is just a pleasure. So thank you for inviting me. And I know we're also sorry that it can't be in person. So I'm going to, um, can I share my screen so I can share with the audience some images while I give a sense of who she is? Okay, so let me see if I can manage that. Um, here we go. Okay. So we're good, right? You can see the opening slide? Right, okay. So Lucy S. Davidovich, first of all, her maiden name is Lucy Schildkret. And that's quite important actually, because she's not Lucy S. Davidovich until 1948, when she's 33. And I'm not trying to emphasize her, mar her late, quote unquote, late marriage in those years, but the name Davidovich is so clearly a Polish name. And that is not insignificant to the way she was perceived later in her life. 
Her maiden name is Lucy Schildkret, and her Yiddish name is Liebe Schildkret. And that is the, those, that's the world she inhabited as a young woman, a woman who was an immigrant daughter, who was like many American Jews of the post-war year. She was born in 1915. She was educated in the American school system, the New York City school system, both its elementary school, its high school, and then college. And simultaneously, she was educated in Yiddishist institutions. So she's a, somewhat of an unusual immigrant daughter in that she is given both kinds of education. So I start, my book is structured in four parts and I describe her life as a narrative arc of transnationality because she's born in America, but she goes to Europe and she makes two very fateful trips to Europe. She goes first in 1938 and spends almost a full year in the city of Vilna, Poland. And we'll talk more about that, a legendary city with a great rabbinic past and also a city known for its Jewish secular Yiddish culture. She leaves Europe shortly after the signing of the Hitler-Stalin Pact and she flees and makes an extraordinary journey. Just thinking about it now should make us all, you know, quaver a little bit. She goes from Vilna, which is in the northern part of Poland, to Warsaw, today in the center of Poland, to Germany, to Berlin, which of course is under Nazi rule, and then to Copenhagen. And that's how she travels in order to get back to take a boat back to the United States. So this is in the very, the, sort of the 11th hour of what we now call the interwar years, the very end of August, 1939. She's in New York during the war where she works at the YIVO Institute, the Yiddish Wissenschaftliche Institute with its director, Max Weinreich, who is a Jew from Courland, but had been running the YIVO in Vilna and then also was fortunately, quite fortunately, en route to a linguistics conference and ends up being out of the front and gets to the United States as well. And then Lucy goes back to Europe after the war to work with Jewish refugees in the DB camps of the American and British zones of occupied Germany, and then comes back to the United States. Now, if you're exhausted by this, forgive me, but it's very important because this shows that she's a quite an unusual American. She's an American immigrant daughter who, unmarried until she's 33 in those years already, not an insignificant fact. And she has the boldness, the courage, the temerity, the chutzpah, to go to Europe in 1938, and then to return after the war. So she is truly an American who acquires a Europeanness, and she also has a perspective on, on Jewish life from Europe, which shapes her view of American Jews. So she really is an intellectual transnational, and um, she doesn't write her major work until she's 60. So she has a long life she writes the war against the Jews. And that's incredibly important to my book as well, because when she returns from Europe in 1947, she marries three weeks later. That's when she becomes Davidovich. And she marries a refugee from Warsaw, Shimon Davidovich, her beloved husband, who lost his first family in the Holocaust. So even though she's not a survivor, she lives with someone who has the burden and the trauma of what was lost personally. And she goes to work for the American Jewish Committee, the most important Jewish defense organization in the United States for two decades. She enters her position there as a secretary and rises to become director of research. Itself a very important story about a woman, little known to most, who becomes a major figure in this, in the AJC, in the American Jewish Committee. And it's only at the end of her tenure at the American Jewish Committee when she writes the first book on Jewish Eastern Europe, which is the Golden Tradition. And that book is her ticket out of the American Jewish Committee to a life as a scholar. And she is hired at Stern College of Yeshiva University to teach American social history and um, another course sort of on American life. But she is perceived as someone who knows something about the Jews of Eastern Europe and because of her background, her biography and her knowledge of Yiddish and Jewish culture, she begins to teach courses on the Holocaust and realizes that there are no books from which to teach. And that's the origins of the book that, became her, that made her famous, The War Against the Jews. So she writes that again, when she's teaching at Stern College and trying to come up with curriculum for her students 
pitches the book, gets a contract, and six years later publishes The War Against the Jews in 1975, as you mentioned. So there's more to say about her, but that's sort of the arc of her early years as she becomes the person who is known, that's Lucy S. Davidovich, the author of The War Against the Jews, 1933 to 1945. So that's her, that's her overarching background. Um, Great. Thank you, Nancy. Um, the three of us got to talk about your projects a couple of times before tonight, and I think we were curious, since it, it often feels like we scholars are sort of called to our projects, what, what experience in your career as a historian, a teacher, um, a woman, uh, what, what about Lucy's story um, made you feel like you had to tell it? Well, Again, thanks so much for the great question. I do feel maybe it's because I spend a lot of time on my books that I feel that they, you know, they, they chose me more than I chose them because if I chose them, I would have abandoned them. Um, but what, what drew me to her was her rootedness in Yiddish secular culture. I mean, that was the hook. So I read her memoir from that place in time 1940, uh, 1937 to 1948, which she wrote at the very end of her life and for which she won the National Jewish Book Award. And I, I'm happy to say I was able to reissue it in 2008 with an introduction. It's just marvelous. I always feel like, well, buy my book, read my book, but actually read her memoir and then read my book. You know, she, the memoir is, is a masterwork and it is, a reflection on her part of the meaning of Yiddish culture and of secular Yiddish culture. She, as I said, was reared in a Yiddishist family with a deep commitment to Yiddish secular culture. And we'll I'll talk a little bit more about it. Well, actually, maybe I even have a pic some pictures here. Yeah, well, this actually, this is a great picture. Um, she was, um, you know, involved with Yiddish culture. And here you see on the right of the slide, a Yiddish letter to a friend of hers and on the left part of the slide, you see that she went to Camp Boibelik, which was the camp of the Shalom Aleichem Folk Institute, a nonpartisan, non-politically aligned Yiddish summer camp, extremely important. You know, we, we tend to dismiss camps as like just a way for kids to get out of their parents' hair. But the educators at Camp Boibelik were all European Jews, and it was a camp in Yiddish. And here you also see her communism. In those years, she, in 1934 to 1936, at Hunter College, she was a communist. So this letter has to do with uh, telling her friend that she's gotten the typewriter from the Communist Party. And you can see the red, um, the red uh, type, typescript there, which I just love. But it was Yiddish culture that she was reflecting on towards the end of her life. What was its meaning? How would it function in American culture um, in the 19, late 1980s? It was so far, it was so changed from her own childhood very few American Jews were being raised in this language. And the language itself had a deep connection to Eastern Europe. And I think at the end of her life, she was reflecting, cogitating, ruminating about what could secular Jewish culture look like without a language? Because the language, as we know, Yiddish is still spoken today, but it's not spoken by secular Jews. And I'm not dismissing the Klezmer revival and, and the commitment, you know, the Yivo summer program had 100 students this year. I myself am a graduate of the YIVO summer program. I also ran the YIVO summer program. We have programs in Yiddish in Tel Aviv and in, and in Oxford and in Vilna now. That's all wonderful, but we, there were probably 11 million people who spoke Yiddish before World War II, and that's, that's not replaceable. So that was my hook, and that was, that was my engagement with her. Um, and then all the other things sort of unfolded as you do the research. And... Um, in my first book, and I, I won't go on and on about it, but my first book is about a masculine, enlightened Jew from the late 18th century who grappled with some of the major questions of mo the modernization of the Jews of Eastern Europe. What's the relationship of modern Jews to tradition? What kind of political allies should Jews have? Should they align with the imperial state? Should they align with national groups in their, in their host countries? Uh, what's the relationship to language? Should they learn German or Russian or Hebrew or Yiddish? What is the, among those four or five, what, what, you know, what can be the most procreative one in terms of Jewish culture, um, you know, et cetera and so forth. Those kinds of questions were at the heart. What's the relationship to liberalism and enlightenment values? That was the, those were the core questions that the masculine I looked at 
was grappling with. And my contention is that those are still the questions of modernity, right? I would say, I don't, I'm not a postmodernist. I do not think those questions have been addressed or answered, or they've been addressed, but they haven't been answered. They're still the questions that, that Jews, modern Jews, who are sentient, who are committed to Jewish life, think about. And it's nationally inflected depending on where you live, the state you live in, the language you learn. And this is true, by the way, for the modern state of Israel as well. I mean, I don't need to tell you that a Jew in Tel Aviv today, if they're thinking about Jewish life, has to come to terms with what those things mean. What's their relationship to democracy? What's their relationship to Jewish tradition? What's their relationship to the rabbinate? Even if they reject all those things, it's part of what they're thinking about. And Lucy Davidovich became yet another vehicle for me to ask those questions of an East European Jew, in, the, in this case, the 20th century, with a transnational identity, someone who had gone back and forth to Europe. So that's why I wrote the book. And I'm not sure I knew that when I started, but it became very clear that she was in many ways a perfect vehicle to get at these really big questions. She herself thought about them and also the documents in her expansive archive and the questions and debates she had with that she published and the way she interacted with her peers and her letters, all those questions were there. So in, for me, there's a, a, a very clear thread between my first book and this book, even though they're 100, you know, 150 years apart. But yeah, there, just, there, thank you. Um, to follow up on that for a second, in her New York Times obituary, um, Davidovitz is, is quoted as saying about that 1938 trip to Poland, you mentioned that Quote, there was a certain irony to my trip to Vilna. I went there with the romantic belief that it might become the world center for a self-sustaining Yiddish culture. And as you, you know, noted, this seems, this was so unusual for her to go and for this young woman to have that kind of romantic belief in the 1930s. Why, um, I mean, I guess you, you just talked to us a bit about why you were attracted to her, but but why was Lucy um, attracted to this Yiddish culture? If any of us have grandparents or great-grandparents of that generation, um, I'm not sure if they were a young American at that time, they would have been attracted in that direction. Well, I don't, you know, one has to be careful not to, you know, to write history as overdetermined. I think it's interesting to note that Lucy has a younger, had a younger sister. Mm -hmm. And she was very different. So, you know, Lucy chose herself, you know, and I think that um, her own agency is extremely important here. But here she is, she's an American immigrant daughter. She's going to, as I said, New York City's public schools, but she's also going to Yiddish supplementary school all the way through high school. So she didn't rebel. She didn't say to her parents, I don't want to do that. And there were plenty of kids who did, would have said that, right? I mean, you know, no, I'm not going to Hebrew school. No, I'm not going to Talmud Torah. Or they cut, they wouldn't go. She obviously cared enough to go. And the people who were her instructors, as I mentioned, were, you know, I mean, they were great intellectuals. One of the most important people is someone named Jacob Shatsky or Jankov Shatsky, who was a giant of interwar Polish Jewish historiography. And he comes to the United States and he's the one who said to her, you are interested in Yiddish culture, go to Vilna. I mean, he didn't think twice about it. And I think, you know, we have to remember, and I think we know this as historians, that it wasn't the interwar years until September 1st, 1939. Mm -hmm. You know, I mean, yes, there was a threat of war. Mm -hmm. Yes, people knew, you know, about appeasement in the Nazi. I mean, I'm not, I'm not saying that people were blind, but, you know, Poland was still sovereign in sept on September 1st, 1939. And then even after the invasion, uh, Vilna was under Soviet rule for 18 months. So, you know, we look back and say, how could she have done that? But look, she was a graduate. She didn't have that many uh, great opportunities for work. She was deeply invested in literature and in Yiddish culture. What better thing to do than to have an adventure and go to Europe? So, you know, she was absolutely engaged with Yiddish culture as a young woman. And it really is a, um, a thread to her very, the very end of her life. In fact, I would say that it's partly, it's sort of her anchor, even as the world around her is changing. So just these pictures to give your audience a sense, this is, and I have to, I love this picture because she looks so happy. And remember, this is, this is 1938, 39 in Vilna. She's in the library. She's just delighted to be there. 
here's her cohort of fellow graduate students or graduate fellows, all of whom are from Europe. And here's Max Weinreich. Um, let's see if you can see him. This is Weinreich, who's again, somewhat legendary. And her other great muse is someone named Zelik Kalmanovich, and he's not there because he's visiting his son, Shalom, who's in Palestine. That's a very interesting and tragic and complicated story. And then just again, it's probably hard for you to see unless you're on a monitor or a big computer, but this is the list of the research topics of the fellows. And in it, it notes where they're from. And it says down here, it says Liebeschildkret, New York. And then it says Yiddish Press in England, the Jewish Press in England. And then again, just to continue this theme about Yiddish culture, after the war, she goes back to Europe. As I said, she works with Jewish refugees in the DP camps. And part of what she does is she gets Yiddish linotype so that the first survivor historians can begin to publish testimonies. Again, this is incredible. This is right after the war is over. And this is the journal of the Historical Commission in Munich. It's called von Letzten Holden, from the most recent destruction. And this is a picture of the salvaged books that she helped catalog when they made their way to New York. Again, a very long story from the Offenbach Archival Depot in Europe, in, in Munich, excuse me, in Frankfurt. And Lucy was there cataloging the books as part of her work. She got free time from the Joint Distribution Committee to do that. And that collection, 420 cases, is now in the, in the Yuva Archives in New York. And very extreme, a very important episode in her life of salvaging the remnants of Jewish culture of Eastern Europe. And then finally, just to give you another sense of part of the book that we can't get into here, her closest friend is a doctor, Pearl Ketcher, whom she works, whom she meets in the British zone of occupied Germany. So all of these experiences are what shape her. And again, but Yiddish culture is really, I just want to reemphasize this, as the fundamental vehicle of diaspora nationalism, right? The belief that the Jews are a people, they can survive in the diaspora, they have creative centers in the diaspora. This is the Dubnovian, Shimon Dubnov's um, um, great ideology of the late 19th century, which is then embodied by the Jewish Labor Bund, the autonomists, and people involved the Shalom Aleichem Folk Institute. And this is what really shapes her. And I'll just show you, let me see, yeah. So even at the very end of her life, she raised money almost single-handedly for the fund for the translation of Jewish literature. And just last year, we now have this incredible translation of the full uh, memoirs of Glickel that were first translated and edited by Chava um, Torniansky from the Yiddish and now translated and we have it. And it was done with the monies raised by Lucy Davidovich in the, for the Fund for Translation of Jewish Literature at the very, very end of her life. So why did she do all this? She did this because of her belief in the Jewish people. And she, because that was going to be the seat of the great secular Jewish communal life. And of course, when she was there, she realized that it was already, it was um, a myth. It was a myth. Well, I have a question for you. Can you go back um, very quickly? I, I saw the I war. can do whatever you want. <laughs> I saw the war against the Jews for a moment. Yeah, 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 we can, yeah, please. Yeah. So I have a question about this. Um, and, I, and I think most of our audience this evening probably know uh, Lucy Davidovich best from this book. Um, it came out in 1975. As I, as I said at the beginning, it went through 30 printings in, in 10 years. It's still in print. Uh, most of us would fall over backwards, you know, for, for something like this. It's, it's just unimaginable in some ways. Um, what was it in your view that, that made this book special? And, and was there something about this book that was quintessentially American? Jewish? Well, what made it special was just, let's think about the timing. How many other books in English, you know, so look, the American Jewish landscape in these years is the, Ameri you know, the largest population of diasporic Jews lives in the United States, right? And most of them are of East European origin. I'm not dismissing, and I know, and I'm fascinated by the non-East European Jewish communities in the United States, but 
you know, the largest Jewish city in the world was New York. It's only now like neck and neck with Tel Aviv, right? But throughout most of the 20th century, the city with the largest population of Jews was New York. So um, here's a book written in English. It's, it's of great significance that, that it's a, a book that's accessible to an English speaking public, Jewish and non-Jewish. So let's start with that. The other, um, there's a lot of debate, and again, you as an historian of the Holocaust probably know this better than I, but there's a lot of debate right now about what people knew when and when they wrote about it, about the catastrophe. And when did the Holocaust or the destruction of the Jews of Europe or the murder of the six million become the Holocaust? And that's a process from the end of the war from 45 through, you know, really the 70s. In the initial years, People did write and think about the destruction, but they often wrote about it in Yiddish, or they wrote about it in commemorative uh, ways. They didn't necessarily write it in scholarly ways. And the scholarship that existed, and there are some very important books written your biographies of Hitler, or what is, or works that were done primarily with German sources, often called perpetrator history. And one of the best examples, uh, and a very important book, is Raoul Hilberg's The Destruction of, of European Jewry. And Lucy Davidovich's book is different. She was informed by, again, I use this word diaspora nationalism. She's informed by a tradition of dia East European historiography, inaugur inaugurated by Dubnov at the end of the 19th century, and which we can see moving through Russia, and Poland in the 20th century. And there's a sc whole school of historians, both from Austria, Habsburg Galicia and then interwar Poland, who are writing Jewish history from Jewish sources. And a very important figure, someone named Philip Friedman. Friedman survives the war. His wife and his child are murdered. He's a survivor historian. He's involved with the uh, von Lefton Holwen and, and he works for the JDC. He and Lucy Tangle, but that's again, another story. But Friedman is very, very important. He's really a pioneer of what we today would call uh, Jewish-centered historiography of the Holocaust. It's extremely important for Friedman and others like him to write from the perspective of the victims. You know, in today's world, we would call that history from below or outsider history. It's not really the way people talk about Jewish history, but that's really what it was. Instead of writing about the machine of destruction, they wrote about how the individuals survived or didn't, and how they responded. And that's the perspective that she comes out of. She comes out of that, what's also known as Chorben Fortune, the literature on destruction, coming out of Jewish sources. And of course she had Yiddish, she didn't have Hebrew and Polish, but she had help with, from her husband. So the book is, is, has two parts, and the second part is all about the Jewish response. And it focuses on German Jewish life under Nazism, and then what happens towards the bitter end in the 30s in German lands, and then it moves eastward. And that on Jewish life in the ghettos and Jewish life, you know, in the destruction, you know, of the Einsatzgruppen. And this is very important. It's not only important because it tells the story or the narrative from the perspective of the victims, but it also shifts the region to the east, to Eastern Europe which has been very late in coming, right? I mean, for many, many people, when you talk about the Holocaust, they think about Auschwitz. They don't realize that they should be talking about Auschwitz-Birkenau, right? That Auschwitz-Birkenau is a complex and that Auschwitz itself was a concentration camp established for Polish political prisoners and Birkenau was a death camp. I mean, I could, we could go on and on, but the point is, is that many, many Jews in Eastern Europe never saw you know, a death camp. They were murdered on sight. And so her book really offers a corrective to perpetrator history. And the other corrective that is, I think, central is that it offers a corrective to Hannah Arendt's Eichmann in Jerusalem, which um, Hannah Arendt, as many people know, is a German Jewish philosopher, political theorist, sometimes a reporter. And she wrote a famous or infamous study of the Eichmann trial, right, when the Israelis kidnapped Adolf Eichmann from Argentina and brought him, and um, he was the man in the glass booth, and um, Holocaust survivor testimony was used. I mean, it's, the Eichmann trial has been written out by many, many people. I don't think I need to go into that, but Hannah, uh, Hannah Arendt wrote a book on the Eichmann trial, 
And in it, she made a couple of very bold and problematic statements. One was about the banality of evil and whether Eichmann himself was motivated by ideology or was just a cog in this kind of perpetrator machine. And the other had to do with the Jewish response to their persecutors. And she claims that if the Jewish police and the men of the Judenrat, the Jewish councils or the Jewish headships, which I think is a better word, that if they had not, quote, participated, far fewer Jews would have died. So she indicts the men of the Judenrat. And Lucy Davidovich would have none of that. So in her, in her book, she's, goes, she criticizes Arendt, but it's somewhat subtle. You only find Arendt's name in one footnote but she outlines the ways in which Jew, the Jewish communal response to the persecution was a, was a symbol of Jewish vitality. And that even the men of the Judenrat, for the most part, did their best to buy time for the enslaved and incarcerated Jews in their ghettos. She acknowledges that a few of them were monomaniacs. We know this from Kofsky and Gens and others, but she highlights the complexity and the limited agency of their actions. So the book really in that regard is a, you know, a feint against Arendt's perspective and an assertion of Jewish agency as actors in history. So I hope I, <laughs> I, hope I give you a sense of why I think it was uh, an important book. And the title itself says it all, the war against the Jews, that there was a war being prosecuted by the Nazis simultaneous with the so-called regular war, right? Uh, the regular war of imperialism, of the, for expansion of power, for regional dominance, for the oil fields of Baku. But simultaneous with that, there was a very specific war driven by anti-Semitic ideology to destroy the civilian population of Jews of Europe. And she, that intentional perspective, what's known as intentionalism, that that was intended from the get-go by Hitler as part of his plan is one of her historiog historiographic um, uh, interpretations. And she insists on that throughout her life, that there was an intentional, intentional campaign to destroy the Jews of Europe. Thanks. Um, I could just follow up on that. Um, you, you, you make a couple other points in the book that I think are very interesting. Um, uh, one of course is, is not only um, her intentionalism with regard to the Holocaust, but, but placing the Holocaust at the center of Hitler's worldview, which, which it seems to me at the time was fairly revolutionary too. I, I, you know, the, the, contem the big contemporary biography of Hitler in those days was uh, Joachim Fest, uh, his book on Hitler, and it, they made it into a documentary, and then it was this big, thick 700-page book, something like four pages um, on, on the Holocaust, which, which is kind of astounding. And you, you make this point that this is a, this is a major corrective to that. Um, but you also make this very interesting point that she was bothered um, by uh, you know, sort of the cult of the of the of the Warsaw Ghetto fighter, and and that this had um, given a certain view of Jew Jewish history um, that wasn't particularly accurate, but also wasn't particularly useful. Um, could you could you talk about that just a bit, and then sure, sure. Um, I don't know if people want to see our faces at this point, or they'd rather see. <laughs> no, no, I think I I don't know what they're looking at. I, I see my screen, but. Um, it, it's, it's a great question and one that I, one of the reasons, you know, I, one reason I like the book, which is not a, a little issue when you work so hard on something, you kind of hate it at the end of it, but is that I still think these issues are really, still issues that are with us, right? I mean, when you talk to people, if they know something about Jewish history during World War II, they'll know about the Warsaw Ghetto, right? Think of the March of the Living, all the trips that kids take, they get schlepped to, you know, the, the, I mean, there's a lot of pushback against it, but that's, that's a symbol. The Warsaw Ghetto Uprising is a symbol. And I would be the last person in the world to dismiss the heroism of the Jews of the Warsaw Ghetto. But what people don't realize is that there were likely 450,000 Jews incarcerated in the Warsaw Ghetto at, at its height Many, many thousands died of typhus and disease and starvation. 
and that at the end, in 1943, uh, when, when the uh, Zhidovska Organizatio Boyanova finally decided that they were going to rise up. There were probably 50,000 Jews in the Warsaw Ghetto, meaning this was a last ditch effort, not to win, but to die with dignity. And that's, that's a, to a, the great credit to these young people, some of whom were as young as 16 and 17 and 18. But the idea that this behavior was normative in the sense of prescriptive, that this is the way Jews should have behaved, and that that's the heroism of the Holocaust, she, to say that she was bothered is, it, she, it drove her nuts, right? The, what she called the apotheosis of resistance. And that, there are several reasons for that. First of all, is uh, she had personal experience. Shimon's daughter, Topcha, was a ghetto fighter, a Bundist ghetto fighter. And she died, she was murdered in the ghetto when she sprained her ankle and couldn't get out to the forest uh, through the sewers. So th she lived with the trauma of Shimon's daughter being murdered in the ghetto as a ghetto fighter. That's A. And there's nothing heroic about trauma. It's just trauma. That's one thing. The other thing is that Lucy was interested not, she was not interested in a historiography that made the survivor narrative the narrative of the Holocaust. She certainly appreciated survivors, what they had gone through, but they were a minority. The majority of the Jews of Europe perished, were murdered. So the story of the Holocaust had to be the success of the war against the Jews, not a triumphalist narrative about survivors. And of course, in the American context, I don't think I need to tell you, we love triumphal narratives of individual resistance, right? That's, you know, we live with that, right? You know, and so she really bucked that trend as well. She also in those years was not a Zionist. She remembered she comes out of left Bundist and secular back. Shimon was a Bundist. She comes herself out of sort of nonpartisan, but leadership. Zionism didn't mean much to her until the very end of her life when she becomes sort of a politically, political Zionist. But Zionism as a cultural response to modernity did not speak to her. And Yad Vashem and Israeli Zionism, resistance was at the core of their understanding of the Holocaust. I mean, that's changed, but in its early years, right? Yom HaShoah v'hagvura, right? The, the day of the Holocaust and of resistance or of heroism. So she was also responding to that, sort of this pushback against the Zionist narrative. And that's just to add one more ingredient to this, She's writing this at the time of cultural upheavals in the United States, right? You have the counterculture of feminism, the new social history, the, the protest against the Vietnam War, and we have our own sort of glorification of resistance and violence in our society. And she, who's interested in stability, and particularly the stability that has allowed Jews a sense of security in the United States, is very suspicious of a kind of um, romanticization of violence and resistance. So for all of those reasons, she just finds this sort of new left, you know, posturing of violence and, you know, the ghetto fighter as hero as, as deeply problematic and historically inaccurate and civilly, you know, destructive. So doesn't stand a chance with her. And she doesn't hesitate to write about it. And when she writes about Mark Edelman, she gets a lot of pushback. She writes about Mark Edelman in commentary and uh, um, he has become sort of the icon of the Warsaw Ghetto Uprising. He was the last commander. And there are a lot of letters against her article. Edelman the Bundist. Uh, yeah, Edelman the Bundist. Right. Yeah, okay. And he himself, he himself did not want to be lionized. But he was lionized, and he is lionized. If you have the chance to go to Okopova, the great cemetery in Warsaw, there's practically a shrine to him now. The guy would be rolling over in his grave. I mean, he absolutely did not want to be, li did not want to be lionized. He said there was as much dignity as walking to the Umschlagplatz as there was putting a rifle on your back. But people want mythic heroes, and Edelman has become a mythic hero. Thank you. We, um, you brought up uh, Hannah Arendt before, and she also comes up in your book when you're 
um, positioning Lucy in relation to the New York Jewish intellectuals who were of Lucy's time, but she never really completely fit into the center of that. How do you explain um, where Lucy stood in comparison to this group that includes many names that our audience is probably familiar with, um, such as... These guys. <laughs> <laughs> So again, one, a really wonderful question. You know, just first of all, look at this, right? What do we notice? They're all guys, right? So I think the gender piece is, is a, a really fascinating one and a very complicated one. It's fascinating because, you know, what was it like for someone like Lucy to try and, you know, go head to head or toe to toe with these guys, right? As a, as a woman and a woman who, uh, you know, didn't have a PhD. Many of them didn't have PhDs, but some of them did. But just a woman in those years where the expectations were not to be a combative, uh, verbally adroit, you know, person, you know, in the public eye. I mean, I I'll talk about Arendt in a second. So, you know, that's important um, already. Um, the, other, the other piece about this that's important is that um, Lucy was not a cosmopolitan New Yorker distant from her Jewish identity, ambivalent about her Jewish identity, and she did not write for sort of the main vehicles that the New York intellectuals wrote in their early years, in their heyday, like Partisan Review. But, you know, that's not, she was writing for her Yiddish magazines in those years, right? So she's really, what's interesting is that she lives a parallel life with some of them, chronologically, and she's similar to them in that she's an immigrant child. And she's similar to them in that she goes, she's educated in New York public schools. She's similar to them in her love of the English language. And I actually think this is not an insignificant, uh, 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 you know, idea or concept. You know, the idea that learning English better than the king or queen, knowing American English lit and English literature better than your neighbors was a, an, a culture, a performance of acculturation and very, very important to all these guys. I mean, they all write incredibly well. Many of them majored in English. That is what you, that is what you did in those days, right? I mean, the intellectuals. And she also majored in English and wrote poetry and, um, you know, Henry James is her favorite writer. And um, so, you know, that, in that regard, she's very much like them. But she's different because of her Yiddishist background, almost to a man, except for Norman Podharetz. These guys are not educated Jewishly, right? Norman Podharetz is, is an outlier and, and very interesting because he goes to Columbia, but he simultaneously he goes to the Jewish Theological Cemetery, uh, se I didn't mean to, seminary. He's educated Jewishly, very seriously. And so he, he comes to his own complex way of looking at America with um, Jewish background. The rest of them don't. I mean, Irving Howe knows Yiddish, and he learns it more for his great translation works and for writing, um, you know, World of Our Fathers. But Kazin almost knows nothing um, Jewishly. I mean, he's an immigrant son, but he, he doesn't know Jewish culture. And so she's very different from them. And then she has the European gravitas and the Holocaust gravitas in the sense of having lived in Vilna. So when these guys, after the war, begin to reflect and ruminate about what has happened to the Jews of Europe, there she is. She, you know, this short East European woman with a Polish husband who was there before and who is an expert on things that they don't know. Mm -hmm. But it also is related to Hannah Arendt, who they were all intoxicated with, and particularly Kazin. I mean, if you want to have fun, Read, Kaysen, read the correspondence between Kaysen and Arendt, and read Kaysen's first wife, Anne Burstein, who only died a couple of years ago, her expose of their marriage and about what it was like to try and compete with Hannah Arendt. It was not fun to try and compete with Hannah Arendt if you were Alfred Kaysen's wife. And Hannah Arendt, you know, represented everything that East European Jews wanted. They wanted culture. They wanted high ideas. They wanted what was called Bildung. And by the way, this goes back to my first book. This is what the East European counter with modernity was about, the acquisition of European, you know, ethos, texts, language, and who arrives on their doorstep? 
you know, in the 30s, Hannah Arendt. And she also has sex appeal in ways that Lucy never had. And she's a great cosmopolitan. And she really is a major figure for them intellectually until Eichmann in Jerusalem, where both it created their own reaction to the Holocaust and also, um, you know, it, it both created Holocaust consciousness and as a reflection of it, they were, and not, not only them, many, many intellectuals in Europe and Israel were, were just enraged by Arendt's interpretation. I mean, there's whole books on this and Richie Cohen did a whole master's thesis on it and Steve Ashheim has written a whole book on it. Um, very important. And many of them were just mortified by her approach to the Holocaust and to East European Jewish culture. And she fell out of favor with most of them, um, not Kazan, but very much with others, including her great friend Gershom Shalom in Jerusalem. There they stopped corresponding after Eichmann. And at that point, these men are looking for some understanding of the East European Jewish past. They're trying to come to terms with what has been lost. And they find Lucy. So she, you know, she becomes the person that they see as able to interpret the civilization that they had some relationship to, but not real knowledge of. Mm. Um, you know, some of those, of these other New York Jewish intellectuals also move right, which is a move that your title um, suggests, the title of your book is From Left to Right, meaning that Lucy, um, though having embraced the left-wing politics of the Yiddish um, working class in the 1930s, moves to the right in the post-war years. Uh, so I'm curious how you explain this political trajectory, which was, you know, different from many post-war Jews, although not all, as we were saying. And I, I was just thinking about your comments about her, um, her value on, of the English language and I, and I guess of a certain kind of culture. I'm, it, it makes me wonder if, if many of these folks who moved right were also concerned about what was happening with culture at that time. It might have looked like the left, um, that the culture was in danger of being ruined by this left. And at that time, I could see how perhaps it seemed like it could be saved in the move to the right. I think you, you know, you kind of answered the question. I'm, um, she, she absolutely, some of them did move to the right. So, um, who did? Podhoretz, Irving Kristol. Bell and Glazer are a little bit more complicated. They kind of are liminal. They, they go back and forth. Um, Bell never called himself a neoconservative. Glazer never would have called himself a neoconservative. They sort of remained um, identified as liberals. But they, they, to a man, they rejected the counterculture. Mm -hmm. And they rejected the new left. I mean, you know, again, you want to have fun read Irving Howe's memoirs about what it was like for him to encounter the new left. I mean, he just thought they were impossible. They were arrogant. They were slob, uh, intellectual, intellectually sloppy. They were romantics. They were, you know, licentious. I mean, just, you know, and the young people felt like, what's the matter of these old guys who are telling us how to make the revolution? You know, they, they've got these secure jobs and they, um, you know, they, they, they're not, they've lost all their, you know, they've lost their real, um, what's the word, you know, they no longer have integrity because they're not really willing to fight the system anymore because they're part of the system. So this divide between the old left and the new left is playing out in the late 60s. And part of it's also playing out in the culture wars, right? You know, and I mean, it's all very complicated, but the beginning of the new history, which is challenging certain canonization of how history is taught and literature, right? you know, what should be taught. I mean, we think we're living through this culture, these culture wars now. This is where it begins. We're having the same, we're having the same fights all the more so now. This is the same issue of, of what is the curriculum of this society and who gets to decide what this curriculum should be. And those are the culture wars of the late 60s. So yes, she felt, as did others, that the civil meritocratic society that had allowed Jews upward mobility was, was being, the barbarians were at the gate. The barbarians were at the gate because that, the universities were under attack, right? I mean, when you think about what it must have been, what it was like, Daniel Bell says this, to be at Columbia University 
when the students take over the president's house and the president calls in the National Guard and there's violence all over the campus mm -hmm. and there's Bell and he says he went back to his house, burst into tears and he left New York. And I mean, if that's Bell's story, but he wasn't alone in feeling that this haven for intellectual discourse, this haven for toleration, this haven for Jews as acculturated Americans was under attack. Mm -hmm. And um, she's very much part of that in her own way. I have some correspondence with her with Morris Abram, who's a very interesting figure from the South and a civil rights activist. And he was president of Brandeis. And of course, Brandeis is up in flames too. And she writes to him, she says, good luck there. And you know, and he says, well, we're trying very hard to be able to negotiate with the students and talk to them. Two years later, he was out of there. He couldn't take it, right? The, they had occupied his offices. So very much so the, cult, the culture kampf, uh, which is inaugurated in the, in the late 60s um, and the war in Vietnam um, and the counterculture and the utopianism and the drug culture and feminism, all these things rattled, rattled the New York intellectuals of the old guard and it rattled someone like Lucy Dobby Jones. Yeah, um, you know, one of the things that might be difficult for some audience members to grasp is why she was, I, I think you might use the term anti-feminist or at least- Oh, definitely. Yeah, I'm okay. Definitely no problem. <laughs> yeah, so she definitely, she doesn't have a, a feminist click moment, um, you know, like, like other women of her generation or later, although it's possible that later generations of, of feminist uh, scholars and historians felt like they benefited from what she had done or, or that she had kind of helped clear the way or get, get you know, getting people used to taking a, a woman scholar seriously. Um, but how do you explain her, her resistance or aversion to feminism in her time? Well, I think there's, there's a lot there. Um, first of all, I think her, you know, in the way that she thought about the world, her binary was Gentile and Jew. Let's just, you know, that's, that's her binary. Mm -hmm. um, and also, let's remember, and you know what, I have to tell, be honest with you, um, Professor Gordon, it just sort of came to me now, I mean, after all these years, mm -hmm. you know, when I think of someone like Betty Friedan or other people, she was not a housewife mm -hmm. washing the laundry and ironing her husband's underwear mm. and packing school lunches for her kids while her brain was atrophying, okay? That, you know, there were many women, when I think about all the graduates of Hunter College, mm -hmm. they were brilliant women. But I'm sure you've spoken to people. I know people who went to the best, you know, most prestigious colleges and when they wanted to go into, you know, go to graduate school, they were basically told, what are you nuts? Get married and, you know, I mean, there are many stories like that. She never had that option. Mm -hmm. She had to earn a living. Mm -hmm. And she didn't, she and Shimon didn't have children. And that's, you know, an interesting question. But I met, she was married at 33 and in the old days. And he was 20 years older than she was. So, I mean, she was always out in the world, mm -hmm. right? She was always, uh, you know, she was always playing in, in the real world of, of money and, and she and then when Shimon died she really had to take care of herself financially and that was you know, a lot of the correspondence is her honorarium from university she was like she wouldn't do it if it wasn't enough money because she really needed so I think part of the click not for all women but for some feminist women is they had been shunted aside and their intellects were were not being regarded and she was living the world of ideas even if there was misogyny or sexism in the way she was regarded so she doesn't have that click and you know that that moment, that consciousness moment. The other is that the the feminist movement was very much part of the counterculture, sort of the aesthetics of it, if I could say, didn't speak to her. Um, its hostility to men did not speak to her. For those radical feminists who were either lesbian or hate, you know, or articulated that the patriarchy was the problem, she loved men, and not only did she love men, she her mentors were all men starting with her relationship with her father, Max Weinreich, Zelda Kalmanovich, Levi Schlera, Yakov Shatsky, you know, Chaim Grada, Shimon, Gershom Sholem. I mean, she loved being taken seriously by men. And she felt that, that it, they weren't men, it was the universal, right? The idea that the male, the, the male world of ideas was a universal world, and she wanted to be taken seriously in it. You know, so I called her an intellectual tomboy. You know, she... 
she was tough as nails, but she didn't want to be invited in because of special female pleading. And um, so she was, she, she found feminism uninteresting. She, she seems to have a problem with, uh, well, <laughs> she did have a problem with, um, with group politics of, uh, of all kinds. And one of the... Um, Except Jewish group politics. Yeah, well, but one of the, you know, one of the, one of the interesting points that you make is her work for the American Jewish Committee after she returns to the U.S., um, after being in, in Germany is the work on communism. And mm -hmm. uh, she, she has no patience with it at all, even in the case with the Rosenbergs, when uh, the, the communists are saying that the US government is anti-Semitic. She said, no, hold on, that, that's not what's going on here. But then in the 60s, uh, you know, you make the point, and I, and I you know, it speaks so well um, to our conflicts today, as you've said, that um, she, she's suspicious of group politics, um, whether it's feminism, you know, she's sympathetic to the civil rights movement and, and yet she's uh, suspicious of black power, the black power movement. Um, again, owing to what she sees as, as its anti-Semitism, but she's a fundamental believer in, in the individual, you know? Um, is, is, this, is this sort of where she is um, on all of this? And I want to encourage people to send in questions. We, we have a couple and, and we're gonna start taking questions in a moment. But, but the, the, um, the big question people, well, the big question I have, you know, um, when, I, when I read the latter parts of the book is what would she think of today's moment? Um, and what would today's moment think of her. I, I think it's a given she would have been canceled or, or something like that. But, but um, it's, a, it's an interesting question to play with. Absolutely. I mean, I, I keep waiting for the, I keep waiting for someone to hate the book. I, <laughs> I mean, I really mean, I mean that seriously, you know. Well, we're, I mean, we're talking to 50 people, so maybe one of them will come. No, I really, you know, I really, I, I mean, I'm not trying to talk about it. the book has been well reviewed so far in you know but it's been well reviewed by I think sort of like-minded people uh, people who think she was a truth teller you know and that it's refreshing to read about someone who said what she thought who was thoughtful and who didn't who didn't you know didn't fly like this with the wind so but I keep waiting you know I keep waiting for like I mean I keep Todd Gitlin, let's just read it and hate it or something. I mean, not, not necessarily that Todd Gitlin would hate it, but I keep waiting for someone who still really positions themselves as a person of the left and who feels like the job of the 60s, that its failures were not because of what it demanded, but because of the incomplete, the incompleteness of it, of the social movements of the 60s. And by the way, I think that African-American activists have every just, are justified in saying that, right? But that's a very separate, issue because of the whole nature of starting from the founding years of our society that uh, of, of chattel slavery. But the book has not yet been reviewed by someone who hates her. Um, I, I, but, I, but it wasn't that easy to get people before the book was published to think about her. She was dismissed. And I think that a lot of people thought, ah, uh, she was a, you know, a red baiter or, oh, she was an anti-feminist or, oh, you know, they had all these they had all these labels on her. Like, why would you write a book about her? She wasn't very nice and, you know, all these kinds of things. So, um, you know, I was interested in her, so I wrote the book. But what she would say about this moment today, I think it's very difficult to say because our moment today both, it, it both draws on our past, the American past, in terms of what we could say sort of left, right, Democratic, Republican, but it's also insane. It, it also doesn't, need, we can't really draw those neat lines so clearly between the contemporary Republican Party and the party of Reagan. I mean, it, it's very complex and I'm not an historian of American politics, so, but I would just say that it's, it's difficult. I think one thing that is clear, and you mentioned it, she had no patience for any kind of um, anti-Semitic expressions 
she would she would have no patience for it. She and and so any group that would sort of forgive the anti-Semitism of X, mm. she would be unforgiving. You know, so in the late '60s, one of the problems is the major many many African American civil rights activists were not anti-Semitic, but the public culture of the Panthers and the public culture of the literati like Leroy Jones, you know, Amiri Baraka, that public culture which. Um, and what happened in WBAI during the teacher strike, even though Julius Lester so interestingly then converted to Judaism and wrote a marvelous book about his own attraction to Jewish culture, even as a young man. But the idea that any movements on the left would allow the voicings of anti-Semitism, mm -hmm. for that she was absolutely, you know, hostile. And of course today the big challenge is the relationship of American politics to the to the critique of Israel and the question of what are the limits of dissent or criticism of contemporary Israeli politics? And is anti-Zionism just a new form of anti-Semitism? Mm -hmm. And I'm not gonna answer all those questions, but I think that those are the questions that today put people in, put round pegs into square holes or put square holes into round pegs, put liberals into places they don't wanna be. And I think that's, that's why her life is interesting because she sort of she she knew this was coming she saw it in her day and she knew it would continue and it has continued it has continued and you know and it means that if you if you hold yourself as someone who's liberal domestically and a supporter of israel because you believe that israel is the embodiment of the jewish people and the and and a product of jewish national consciousness of the 19th century, if you know your Zionist history and know where it was born, you know, Zionism is the diaspora nationalist movement of the 19th century. If you know all that, and then you also know the complexities of the Middle East, where do you fit in the left? That, I think, that question endures. Where she would come down right now, and I don't want to hazard a guess. Well, thank you so much. Can we can we get to some uh, some questions from the audience because there there are some. Um, there's one from a student that said, um, "Can you can you tell us about Lucy's family life?" And I'm going to supplement that with another question that comes in: Was there conflict between Davidovich and her family about the counterculture insofar as her niece was at Berkeley? I did not know this. Did you know that? I don't think her. I don't think Lori was at Berkeley, um, but. That's all right. So right. when you fa say her family, I don't know if there's a way to ask this. Do you mean the family, her natal family, or then her? Yeah, that, that's, uh, yeah. Okay, uh, so, Lucy, so Lucy is born to immigrant family in the Bronx. She has a younger sister, Eleanor. And they're both sort of, as I said, typical immigrant uh, daughters. They both uh, go to the Yiddish school system. Her sister doesn't have the academic, um, uh, you know, academic power that Lucy does, um, has a harder time finishing college, um, marries actually a, a Catholic guy and has two children. So Lucy is an aunt to two nieces, one of whom becomes a geologist and one of whom becomes an attorney. And it's Lori Sapokov cohen who gave me, when I found her, gave me a lot of documents. So that's just sort of a sense of who that is. Um, you know, she was a loving aunt and their memories of her are very positive, and there's a lot of um, wonderful correspondence between them. She was a great, uh, she bought great gifts. She, you know, whenever, when she was in Europe, she would bring back beautiful things for her nieces and always took them out. So, um, you know, there, the conflicts in her natal family were on a more psychological level. I think, she, not I think, she had a very difficult relationship with her mother. Now, I don't have a lot of documents about it, but I think the telltale sign is when you read her memoir, she doesn't mention her parents' names. Hmm. So it's sort of like this glaring, you know, they are her past and the people whom she loves or the family that she feels taken care of by are the Kalmanoviches, Zelig and Rivala Kalmanovich. And she says, they were like parents to me. I mean. Uh, she describes it. Of her two parents, she was closer to her father. Um, and, you know, again, that's a little bit the daughter-father thing. Happens a lot with intellectual daughters. I think that they have a father that's intellectual. Um, 
so that's the conflict is more more psychological. Um, mm -hmm. I don't think she had a warm, any kind of warm sense of her parents. So I, I did I answer? I hope I addressed that question. I hope I addressed that question. Um, there's another question you you address this in the book, so um, I think it's a good one to ask. Uh, did did she see a parallel um, between Jewish history, um, recent Jewish history, and uh, uh, the the civil the civil rights movement. In other words, um, her 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 um, her move to the right would seem to be contradicted by the fact um, that Jewish persecution and African American persecution would seem to have similarities to them. And and how did she deal with uh, you know the the seeming conflict in her own thinking? Well, I think you know she again. She thought, I think she, she would argue it's apples and oranges. Mm -hmm. It's apples and oranges. And by the way, James Baldwin thought it was apples and oranges too. I mean, Baldwin, an American treasure, you know, he understood that the persecution of African American, black people in America was a different, or, different order than the persecution of Jews in Europe. He understood that they were both heinous, but they were not the same thing. They were not the same thing. And just because you're victimized doesn't mean you're necessarily going to be good bedfellows. And the issue about the Jewish engagement with civil rights, which is so important, is because the Jewish commitment to civil rights in this country in the 20s comes out of an ethos that a more pluralistic society, a society that is open-minded and tolerant, and doesn't allow discrimination against groups, will be better for Jews. That's, that's where, it, that's, that's what the Jewish, the American Jewish Committee fights and the American Jewish Congress and even the ADL, that group persecution is going to be dangerous for Jews. So Jews should fight against persecution and discrimination against groups. And again, what you had mentioned earlier about sort of the allow individuals to excel in their, on their own, right? So that's where the, the Jewish fight for civil rights. And of course, let me be clear, Jews who are active this way often do make parallels between themselves and African-Americans, right? So I'm not saying that their self-identity, where they see parallels with African-American history and their own persecution and the commonalities of victimization, they articulate that. I mean, we have whole collections, you know, Michael Stapp's collection on the Jewish counterculture, and you look at the Freedom Seder, and I mean, all and the whole reform movement. I mean, you know, you should treat the stranger, strangers yourself. So there are articulations by Jews that they and African Americans or they and Black Americans share something. The problem is persecution is not enough. And by the 60s, the socioeconomic distinctions between American Jews who are coded as white and Black Americans who obviously are not white and their positionality in our society is so different. And that's part of the fissure in the movement because the institutions that have allowed Jewish integration are the very institutions that have created obstacles for African-Americans. I mean, think about what we know about the GI Bill. Think about what we know about housing discrimination. Think about what we know about and banks. All those institutions that gave, you know, returning soldiers cheap mortgages and allowed Jews to move to Levittown. I mean, they are the same institutions that discriminate against African Americans. So Jews and Blacks actually don't share such a common history, except the idea that a democratic liberal society, which, is, which allows the advancements of individuals, is in the interest of both groups. Mm -hmm. But the civil rights movement, and un perhaps understandably, and even today, talks about group rights right? Group rights and affirmative action. And that makes Jews of Lucy's generation extremely nervous because they do not want Jews to be recognized as a group with rights in American society. Jews are a religion. That's the way Amer I mean, I think about Rachel Gordon's work. Right? Yeah. Judaism is, an, is part of the American religious landscape. And that's Jews are a confession. They're not a group. And on that note, just to confuse everyone, that's the problem is that Lucy has now, she is both an American and an East European because in Eastern Europe, 
Jews are a group. Jews are a group in the imperial context of Eastern Europe, and they can demand group rights as they do in Versailles, right? The minorities treaties and the interwar years. And that's what Dubnov wanted. So there's a, a transnational conflict there, intellectual conflict. And I probably confuse people, but it, it's in, uh, it's that, in the demand book. For, that demand for group rights didn't, uh, didn't work terribly well, but um, yeah. Um, I like the next question because it's a, it's a big part of the book and we didn't get to it in our discussion. Um, her interest in writing a history of the Jews in the United States. Um, you, you, you said a lot about that in the book, um, that it was, it was a project she began, but was kind of an unfinished project. She was very interested in Jewish merchants. She had um, uh, boxes and boxes of material. Could you elaborate a little bit um, on, on why this was of interest to her? Yeah, thank you. Again, great, great question, whoever asked that. Great question. So first, one thing that um, is important is that Lucy got a master's degree at Columbia University under Sailor Baron. Sailor Baron, some of you may know, you out there in the ether, is a Polish Jew actually from Tarnów, from East Galicia, who became stateless after World War I, and he had three doctorates, and he comes to the United States in 1920 and becomes the second person to hold a position in Jewish studies at an American university, right? And Baron is the giant of 20th century uh, historiography. Um, many people don't read Baron today, but it's worth it. It's worth it. And Lucy studied with him. And Baron really believed in the future historiographic uh, contribution of American Jewish studies, which is very interesting for all kinds of reasons about the Columbia program. Um, and so Baron really believed, again, the American diaspora was the largest diaspora. And he believed that there had to be serious study of the American Jewish past. So she embarked on this. And, and she embarked on it, I think, for several reasons. One, I think the influence of Baron. She wrote her own master's thesis on Lewis Marshall, who was the president of the American Jewish Committee. And um, she also had the linguistic ability to deal with American sources as opposed to, you know, she knew Yiddish and she knew English, but she couldn't, she couldn't deal, I mean, she knew, and she knew German, but she couldn't, you know, she wasn't running around to archives in Ukraine, for example. So she did want to write about it. She felt that it was important, uh, extremely important. Um, but in those years, I mean, again, it's not like today. There weren't, there were, there was Jacob Rader Marcus. There weren't a whole lot of people doing it. And America's a vast country, and we didn't have the archival collections we have today, when I think of all the resources that are available for someone who wants to write a good history of American Jewry. So she was really very much a pioneer in that. Um, and the other, I think, problem for her, and well, not so much problem, I think she wanted to get away from the Holocaust, but really couldn't. It was too much a part of her. So it was sort of this desire somehow to make her mark, not on the death and destruction, but on the next creative part of, of Jewish life, which would be America, because she couldn't write about Israel. She didn't, have, she didn't have Hebrew. But she also wanted to talk about the success and the integration of Jews, which she believed was also due to their, their socioeconomic success. And what's so interesting, again, she was prescient here. She really felt that the new social history, which focused on the working class and the proletariat and the, um, you know, the inarticulate and slave narratives and women, although people are left out of history, that historiographic impulse of the late 60s, which of course goes hand in hand with the social movements of the 60s, meant that how could you write about the Jewish merchant class, right? Because those are the bad guys, right? Those are the guys who've made it. And a good example of this, by the way, is Norman Pothartz's memoir. His first memoir is called Making It. And it's a brilliant book. I mean, you may hate it, but it's a brilliant book because he's unapologetic about Jewish success. And he doesn't say Jewish, Jews are successful because they're better than other people. He said, let's just celebrate where we, what, what, what we've done, right? And what I personally, Norman Barnard's have done. And Lucy wrote an essay um, about writing, you know, the history of Jewish business. And it was only published after she died. And if you read the essay, which is, it's in what is the collection, What is the Use of Jewish History? It's again prescient because she points out this, what we call today the economic turn. People are much more interested in what, how did these peddlers become shop owners? 
what is it about the Jewish department store, whether it's in Europe, you know, the KDV, or, you know, uh, you know, ANS, you know, what is it about Jews and the middle creating of the, the, the middle class, you know, Marion Kaplan's book. So she anticipated many of the historiographic concerns we have today, but in her moment, you know, writing about successful Jewish merchants just wasn't what young people and young historians and graduate programs were interested in. So she, again, was out of step then, but I think saw the future in ways that people didn't anticipate. Thanks. We, we have another question from a student. Um, from what you found in your research, what, <clears throat> what would you say about how Lucy Davidovich viewed Jews of America um, versus uh, European Jews? Well, I'm not sure uh, what aspect, and I don't know if the person can yeah. add in what aspect of it. Um, she was optimistic about American Jewish life among the Orthodox actually. She um, despaired of cultural ethnic Jewish culture that was not steeped in the texts and the practices of Jewish civilization. So in that regard, she would have been, you know, I'd say cr very critical. And this gets to the, to the culture question that Professor Gordon asked about, you know, sort of the culture of American Jews that she would have, and again, her elitism in her intellectual elitism or expertise, you know, the culture of American Jews that wasn't literate, you know, that wasn't high culture. She aspired to high culture. And that was the generation, her generation, right? You study Henry James, you read the best literature. And there is such a thing as the best literature, right? There is a canon. So she was in that regard, um, not happy with the direction of American Jewish culture but she was actually optimistic about orthodoxy. And partly the orthodoxy of her years was a very open orthodoxy. And I don't wanna get into, you know, today's orthodoxy is moved to the right. But I mean, the people who she, whom she admired were someone like Rabbi David Mursky, who was the Dean of, Yeshiva, uh, of um, the graduate program at Yeshiva University, a polymath, or Gershon Cohen, who taught, was an historian at the Jewish Theological Seminary, who was also, you know, a polymath and, and loved jazz. And, you know, Saul Berman, who's a very open-minded um, Orthodox rabbi still living today and who, who knew her and was a great mentor to her. So she was optimistic about American Jews who knew Jewish culture. And when, when I say Jewish culture, she meant the texts of the Jewish tradition, that which had shaped the civilization in Europe. And in that regard, she was optimistic. Um, and she actually, in her, um, in her exchanges with Irving Howe, over World of Our Fathers, his extraordinary elegy, both to his father personally and to the world of East European Jewry, she said to him, I'm not sure what you're mourning, meaning that culture of secular Yiddish life is over. Let go of it. The future is going to be different and it's going to have a religious component. And that will be what will sustain Jewish culture in this country. So, you know, and he, co he couldn't get over it. It was too important to him. But I have, you know, wonderful exchange between them about that. Well, she came to this view as well, you know, that, uh, that, that there ultimately could be no gel holding Jews together if it wasn't going to be religion, yes? Well, religion at least, yes, religion, absolutely. Mm -hmm. And she came to that view, Weinreich came to that view mm -hmm. because, you know, secular, and religious is a Christian concept. It's not a Jewish concept, it's not a Muslim concept. Right? Yeah. Ju Judaism is a all-encompassing tradition. You know, the Talmud deals with tort law and it deals with, uh, you know, fast, the fast laws of Yom Kippur. It doesn't distinguish that one is religious and one is not, mm -hmm. right? So Jewish culture and East European Jewish culture are trying to fit into the American binary of religious and secular is endlessly challenging and problematic and uh, remains, remains so today. Do we have any more questions? This, is, this has been a fascinating discussion. Um, I'm gonna, I'm going, can we, can we stop the screen share because I want- Yeah, I just want to show you one picture. Oh then yeah. We'll <laughs> yeah, I'll, I'll, no more screen sharing, there we go, gone, yeah. Okay, great. Um, yeah, we're, we're 
pushing up against um, 830. Um, and, you know, I want to thank you again for a wonderful discussion. Um, it, it, <laughs> I, I, I don't know, I don't know how to feel about this. Um, you know, in the old days before COVID, we <laughs> used to have people physically come. And, you know, these things were always very nice. And yet I, I feel that when we do it virtually, um, you know, we, we are able to get more people um, beyond the Gainesville area too. Um, than we would ordinarily be able to get. And so there, there's a lot to think about this. But um, I, I received texts um, uh, from some, some people watching and they said, boy, Professor Sinkoff is just a, just a wonderful speaker. Um, so, so thank you very much. Um, if you've not, if, if, if you've not um, read the book, everyone, uh, from left to right, Lucy, Estevinovich, New York Intellectuals and the Politics of Jewish History. I think um, Rachel and I can, can both uh, really recommend it. It's a fascinating read. Oh, there <laughs> <you. Thank you. laughs> And a wonderful cover as well. Mm -hmm. um, I, I would like to, to thank uh, Professor Nancy Sinkoff for a wonderful discussion and Professor Rachel Gordon um, for helping uh, me to keep this discussion going. I, I think it was um, fascinating. And when uh, COVID ends, if it ever ends, we will have you down to Gainesville for um, a live performance. But Beautiful. thank you everyone for coming. Um, and thank you so much. Oh, oh wait, wait, don't, don't go anywhere yet, everybody. I did. Can I make one, I want to say one, can I make one little teeny comment? So first I'm gonna thank you both for great questions and uh, the comment that having a Europeanist and an Americanist, uh, you know, it really is what the book tried to do. And it's called a biography, but I really was trying, you know, I don't want to be pigeonholed, you know, it's, it's through a life, this whole, the 20th century. And the other part of the book that no one, people don't ask about, but which is very relevant to me, which is her whole view of Poland and Polish Jewish relations. And um, again, here we are in 2020 when, for those of you who pay attention to the contemporary Polish government and the rewriting of history and the rewriting of Polish-Jewish relations and the rewriting of museum exhibits, um, you know, again, her anticipation of some of those issues are in the book as well. And it's, um, you know, it's quite tragic, I think, but it's, it's very, it's again a very apt, she, she really saw these problems that were just, they're, they're, they've raised their head once again, this whole question of Pol, Christian Poles and Jewish Poles. Uh, anyway, so. Can I, can I, uh, yeah, because when I read that part, um, you know, it made me think of Ringelblum and his optimism, even when the worst was happening. Uh, yeah. And, and her pessimism after the fact. I want to also say something else about this book. There, there are just some wonderful lines in it. And I, and I think one of my favorites <laughs> is when she uh, left Vilna for Warsaw, went through Berlin, and she was sitting in a railroad compartment <laughs> with um, a, a German businessman, uh, very stately, uh, with a Nazi party pin in his lapel. Um, and, uh, and he spoke English and he was very enthusiastic about the regime very shortly before Germany attacked Poland. Um, and, and you quote her as writing a friend um, saying it, it was like speaking with a, a very polite lunatic or, or something. It's just, just, there's just, just some wonderful lines um, in there and uh, I, I, I recommend it very highly. Um, everyone, uh, please keep in touch with us uh, here at the Center for, um, for Jewish Studies. Uh, visit our website, um, uh, uh, jst.ufl.edu. Um, our next event is October 6th, um, which is also a Tuesday. We will have a panel discussion uh, on the Jewish vote, Florida, and the election of 2020. <laughs> of I think it'll be interesting. Um, in any event, keep checking your email. We'll, we'll surely let you know about that. And then later in October, we have um, another fascinating event uh, on Yiddish uh, poetry of the left in the early 20th century. 
um, and the idea of social justice. You know, another another very timely, um, a very, another very timely uh, subject. And our guest then will be uh, Amelia Glazer from the University of California at San Diego. Professor Rachel Gordon, Professor Nancy Sinkoff, thank you so much uh, for tonight. Thank you. It was a fascinating uh, talk, and I can't wait to do it again sometime. Great. Okay, everyone be healthy and well, right? Um, Nancy, Rachel, let's, uh, I'm going to send you a link, and we'll, we'll talk afterwards. Okay, great, great. Thank you. Night, everybody. Good night, everyone.